We're live. Welcome, everybody, back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Greta Center CUNY in New York City in Manhattan at the City University. And uh, for us, I think it's week 14 or even 15 of our talks, which we started in March. And um, since then, we have taken a, a sample, a survey of what is happening uh, to our profession, to our colleagues in the world of theater and performance, thinkers and curators for theater and performance. And uh, we have traveled around the globe. Um, over 70, 80 artists and countries have been part of these talks. It's a unique document we are realizing actually now where we are archiving the presence and, um, and most probably will be the only profession that has such a, a wide uh, record of you know, what happened and what, what, how it, did people feel, what did they think about, uh, what actions did they take, and what um, are solutions or ideas or new forms that are emerging. And it's still um, ongoing. Um, of course, uh, the, the crisis does not seem to go away. We all thought that uh, the summer will, will be perhaps a time where we have to worry less. It gets warmer, the virus will go away, but it's not the case to still have 2.5 million infections uh, uh, worldwide, uh, 500,000 dead people in America. Of course, because it's a large number of people here, but still America is at the forefront um, with um, so many uh, cases, 120, 130,000 confirmed cases. Most probably it's the double. People say also infections are 10 times higher, so maybe 25 million um, are infected and still herd immunity is only one or 2% of the population have it. There's 70 would need it, so it's, a, it's all shocking. We have a government that seems to be incompetent to handle it. They played it down, didn't take it serious. Trump refuses to wear a mask. Uh, tell people to inject a disinfectant, was hiding in a bunker when there was a little demonstration that seemed to be out of control in front of the White House. He's threatening to use military against their own people. He is supposed to protect them and help them. Um, helicopters were flying in uh, war tactics, maneuver-like uh, uh, actions over pro protesters. Yesterday, two people in St. Louis in a little uh, uh, private neighborhood, uh, uh, gated community, were drawing guns and semi-automatic weapons against protesters. The mayor, um, against uh, uh, common sense, listed names officially of people who said defund the police, take some of the money, put it in social services, perhaps even in art, put it in prison reform. And she read the names and addresses out loud uh, in Missouri uh, after the Ferguson murder of uh, Trevor Martin. Many protesters got killed mysteriously and they are under threat. So she did this publicly and people said, well, then we also go where you are, but she's in a gated community. People went in 200 very peacefully, but they opened the door, broke, I think, the seal and uh, they got threatened by guns. Trump retweeted it, of course, without anything. So temperatures are rising. Over 40 million people uh, filed for unemployment and certainly about 20 million uh, down now. And uh, slowly things are opening and now they are closing again. Texas, Arizona, Florida have catastrophic uh, situations. They ignored it. They made fun of the situation that it's a democratic hoax. And now their people are paying with their lives um, um, for that. And uh, New York City has been uh, fantastic uh, actually in, in the resolve. It was the last to make plans to open up and uh, and um, there have only last Thursday 18 new infections per day. Uh, we had 1,200 in, in May, so uh, something seems to be working, but also the governors of New York and New Jersey are alarmed by the spikes in numbers and they are reconsidering the opening. The phase three was supposed to start at July 6. All restaurants can open at 50% capacity but uh, uh, they are wondering if this is the right thing to do. Uh, the restaurant owners are furious. They bought all the supplies and they might not, not be possible, but it's serious. It's about people's lives and nobody really has a good answer. The European Union uh, announced uh, today that uh, 15 states will come and fly, can have their airplanes come to uh, Europe again. The US is not under it. It joins countries like Russia and Brazil. It's a shocking development. Um, I think Algeria, Australia, China, Canada, Georgia, Japan, uh, Mont Montenegro, Morocco, New Zealand, even Rwanda, Serbia, South Korea, Thailand, Tunisia, and Uruguay. Everybody can fly in, but the disastrous politics here in the U.S. Uh, 
not really thinking ahead of testing, not thinking ahead of having heat sensors at events, um, and Trump's uh, closing of the U.S. borders overnight without consultation, when there were very, very low numbers, even in the U Europe. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, U.S. became such a disaster. Uh, it was shocking also to Europeans, and Europeans seem to have it a bit better um, under control. So uh, Broadway yesterday announced that it did close down. It's going to be dark till the end of the year, most probably till next spring. Nothing is happening. Devastating news for artists, uh, everybody involved, technicians, live people. Metropolitan Opera hasn't paid their people since March. And we don't know what will happen. 60 million, 60 million tourists normally come and more to New York City. It's all breaking away. There is no restaurants and uh, everybody wonders what will happen to New York. Will it be uh, uh, the same city we all love and know? And also yesterday, but it's Kimi and, uh, and, um, uh, and, and a choreographer from the Laundromat project, uh, the uh, we did have a serious a conversation about the city uh, and the future and how neighborhoods have to stick together, how we have to create um, places um, and, and for that. So um, we are in deep, deep sorrow, but um, we are not uh, the only one, of course, in the world who uh, have such problems. We all hope a virus vaccination will come soon. The yesterday, the antiviral drug Remdesivir, which has some moderate success, was introduced. Most probably the treatment will be between two and a half thousand and three thousand dollars to produce the pill. It's only five dollars, even covering costs and a little profit. So it could be just twenty five dollars. And American taxpayers have to pay for airplane industries, car industries uh, to bail out big things. But they still want three thousand dollars per patient from an industry um, that seems to be now doing well. It just shows everything is so wrong. Everybody who lost their job in America lost health insurance. It's a disaster, and um, and we don't really know uh, where this will be happening. Numbers in Brazil and Iran and everywhere are, are scary, and um, and artists are responding. Artists are the ones on the right side in the complex struggle for uh, freedoms and liberties. Artists are the one who, on the side of social progress, always have anticipated the future, are in the present, see perhaps a bit better of what it is and we all should listen to them, should have listened to them uh, earlier and so many plays uh, warned about catastrophes, ecological disasters. And uh, today we have um, uh, two significant artists uh, from um, the world um, of theater uh, with us. And um, I'm really, uh, I'm really uh, thrilled to have them with us. There is, uh, was that Giannina Cabunario from uh, Romania? To say it right, and Yeton uh, Nizirai from uh, Kosovo. Both of them have been at the Siegel. Both of them are a significant artists um, of their own. Uh, Janina is a director, playwright, and manager of a theater and the curator of a theater festival um, in uh, Romania. She has been at the Kammerspiele Munich and uh, many, many uh, other places. Yeton is the director um, of his own company uh, in Kosovo after serving as the artistic director of the National Theatre in Kosovo and as a playwright. He has worked in many, many places, including Volkswagen Berlin. He came to uh, New York City, um, uh, to La Mama, where we, we had a great, uh, great discussion in the German uh, Theater der Zeit magazine says he is the Kafka of the Balkans as a playwright. So. Um, these are two serious artists who are politically engaged, socially engaged, and we are here to listen um, to them. So you guys, sorry for my long introduction. We just are a little bit upset here in the, in the US about what's happening. And we also looking outside to see what are artists thinking? What are they doing? What forms are they finding? So tell us a little bit, maybe Janina, we start with you. What time is it? Where are you? I'm in Bucharest and it's um, 7 p.m. I am not in the, um, the city where the theater is. The theater is in the city Piatra Nams and it is mm -hmm. called uh, Teatrul Tineretului. Mm -hmm. But for the moment, I'm in, I'm in Bucharest. And uh, with Yeton, we just uh, finished our participation in a digital festival in uh, Volksbühne a few days ago. A digital festival at the Volksbühne. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeton, where are you? I am home in uh, Pristina in Kosovo. So now it's uh, 6 uh, p.m. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this, uh, to this conversation after your 
very dramatic introduction. So I hope you'll relax it a bit. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So tell us what's what happened at the Volkspunner. Which one do you want? Which perspective? There are two. Well, each one can say one of them or one of you, yeah. Janina, maybe. Well, very briefly, it was um, a festival called the Post West, about the world after East and West. And um, we started to work together since um, June 2019 to meet, to prepare the festival that was supposed to happen in May uh, 2020. And because of this um, situation with the coronavirus, we had to, how do you say, to change from the live concept to a digital one. So the festival happened between um, 24th and 26th of June. And each of us had to send a digital contribution to the, um, to the festival. And of course, apart the, these digital productions or products, uh, there are a lot of panels and discussions and Q&As with uh, the artists invited from another 10 countries, if I'm not mistaken, yet on. Yeah, 10 or, tw or 12. But it's important to say that uh, it took the, maybe until mid-April until uh, they decided that the original festival is not going to happen as it was planned. So basically we had really uh, around three weeks maybe to prepare something digitally for the for the festival in june so it was also for us lots of pressure but i guess also for for them and uh, i mean the main struggle that we have to say was that uh, for us it was surprising that they were not able to find a, a slot uh, for the festival even next year i mean this year it was obvious that they had no mm -hmm. uh, no i mean idea if uh, theater will will be open but also next year they couldn't find a, a slot and that was interesting and it is interesting in my in my opinion also because it shows how german theater works we had another big project that was cancelled and that had nothing to do with this year that was planned the production or co-production was planned for 2021 and it was cancelled now as a consequence of of uh, of this uh, i mean this pandemic now and this is for me interesting because <laughs> i mean in here we plan things or things might go wrong for the next two three months but not that far in that far away yeah. in advance oh, yes is it already with rene polish at the helm at the Volksbühne, or is it still the in-between time between polish or kastorf it's in between it's in between oh. so tell us a bit what did it mean for you to adapt to to react to corona time you were preparing a show to travel there with a theater play and then you couldn't so what did you do what did you decide what complications and what solutions did you find of course it came as a shock to everybody and uh, the first discussion the first time we heard about this possibility of changing to a digital uh, version was on 28th of april and then we decided on 15th of may yet on if you remember yes yes so, it was very, very short time and it was a shock because actually we, we were all and we are all theater artists. So it's very, um, I don't know, um, strange uh, in one second to shift your, even your ways of expression. For instance, I decided to do a visual essay and uh, not to, to, to record the reading or something. I really had to change completely my way of um, thinking for this project. What's but a visual essay? Yeah, Sorry? what's a what's a visual essay? Well, um, it's um, what I wanted to do is, in a way, to to document a process, my own process, my personal process as an artist. So uh, when um, when we when the lockdown started in Romania, I, um, I had to stop the rehearsals. I was just starting the rehearsals, but I've done before some research and even recordings. Um, I was traveling and recording uh, different things on the topic of uh, waste, of the transport of the waste from west to east. 
to Romania. So, um, but not only not only this, a, a lot a lot of other subjects uh, somehow interfere with this uh, topic of waste. So I had a part of recordings from that uh, moment of the research, and then uh, I um, I took um, from different photographers photos with things that were I don't know interesting or yeah uh, strange for me during the lockdown, like the moment of the workers leaving um, Romania during lockdown to Germany to work. Yeah. So th this was a very strange movement in the middle of lockdown. And I'm sure everybody knows uh, about this uh, thing. And the uh, yeah, scenes at the airports, no mask, uh, nobody could come in, but thousands could come out when they were gone. They wouldn't be let in because they were afraid that they could have the exactly. virus. It's a kind of schizophrenic a situation yeah. and um... exactly and then also um in connection with the east and west um we all know what happened afterwards after they left romania i mean um, there are huge scandals now in germany about um, the situation of this uh, of these people of course these uh, precarious working conditions were already existing for many mm -hmm. many years but now yeah. they became very clear yeah, to slaughterhouses everyone. in Germany had the highest infection next to old age homes. By the way, I think 50% of all Corona cases in the US are in old age homes. But the slaughterhouses in Germany next to old age homes have the highest concentration uh, out of 2,000 uh, uh, workers, 300 or more have coronavirus and they live together in terrible conditions. They rent pay to the boss or, or the company they work for. They don't show up for work. Uh, uh, healthy, they will money will be taken away. They have to pay extra fines, and so as you said, it was un intolerable before. Intolerable before. It, it, it existed before because I was documenting this uh, situation five years ago. It was exactly the same with people mm -hmm. living together, like eight in a room and so on, with very bad conditions, working conditions. But also, uh, they have no health insurance in Germany. Yeah. So the moment something happens to them, they are really uh, without any help. So I think this is a huge topic now in Europe and not only about these precarious um, conditions and uh, to put it very directly, uh, modern sla slavery, because it's exactly what it is. Yeah. So uh, And then, of course, um, in this essay, visual essay, um, I was trying also to bring um people that were initially in the project like my actors so i had them as well and i also had the zoom the zoom meeting the shocking uh, zoom meeting on 28th of april when we were announced that we uh we changed from live festival to digital festival so in a way i tried to put together all this year of research meetings and uh, also uh, how do you say these um, concrete things from the reality and also our personal and our artistic journey somehow to put them together in this, uh, I don't know, frame of tensions between East and West. That's and you what had people in different homes, different Zoom, people were just from their no. homes joining or was it just you reading and playing, sharing your um, screen? Well, I was not reading myself. I found a digital voice because yeah. my, my contribution was called Post West Something Digital. So I mm -hmm. had the Google voice uh, reading the essay and then you could see all these uh, pictures and um, how do you say um, uh, videos um, going on. It's wonderful. I mean, almost like Lula Arias should invite you for her series of uh, research. Yeah, there's a big scandal with the Romanian workers and the Tennis, the uh, uh, business owner of these, of, of a third almost of all German slaughterhouses. He gives his money to soccer clubs, Schalke and Bielefeld, big millions, and uh, it was accepted. And people knew somehow something isn't wrong with subcontractors and sub subcontractors. But with so many things, uh, Corona exposes uh, structures, I, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it is a, it's a good thing. Yeah. I would add to this, um, to what you said, the fact that about East and West, it proved that uh, Clemens Tonis has huge business with land in Romania. 
Oh, so uh, mm -hmm. he's also very much involved in this agro-industrial um, yeah, uh, thing in Romania. So there are so many connections actually in Europe today. And uh, the moment you start to look uh, carefully, like we had to, do, we could do in the pandemic, you could see there a lot of, of um, abuse actually. Mm -hmm. And also um, we can see what happens in these um, slaughterhouses and um, asparagus farms. But there is one thing that nobody spoke about yet, like really carefully, and this is domestic care. Because there are a lot of women going to Italy, to Austria or to Germany, but there it's private, uh, how do you say, house. Mm -hmm. So you cannot enter, you don't know what's going on inside. And I think, um, yeah, it's another door that yeah. should be open. And families also put healthcare workers at risk. They think, oh, the healthcare workers one, but it could be families because infections come through families. Jayton, how did you deal with that? What, what, did, what was your uh, contribution to the festival original and how did you change it? Well, we plan to produce a, a normal theater performance called The Return of Karl May. So we had the well-known German author, and especially our focus was on, uh, on one of his novels called uh, Durch das Land des Kipetaren, Through the Land. Yes, yes. Ben. It's Kara ben Nemsi, the exactly. hero. Yes, yeah. So we have actually Kara ben Nemsi as the main character who shows up in, in, in Kosovo, and uh, with a group of Kosovo actors, he aims for the German land, so where he belongs. That was the original plan, and normally the you know we wanted to start in uh, around 15th of um, March to rehearse with a group of uh, six actors from the National Theatre, but this was of course not possible. So then, uh, when this idea for the digital festival came, so of course we were also panicking what to do, and this is not our field. This is not something we can handle. But then, uh, you know, we decided that uh, we can actually film. It, it, for me, as a playwright, I thought, let's film uh, rehearsed reading. I mean, let's go to the National Theatre and actors can read. But then Blit, as a director, she wanted something more. And then what we got is a 40 minutes uh, extracts from the future theatre production. So I don't know how I should call this, but uh, you know, I called it uh, video extracts from a theatrical production. So now- Interesting, so let's say you said, uh, so you said I present video extracts from a future production. Yeah. That's in almost like a, t a title of a, a art exhibition, yeah. Well, the, 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 I mean, the title of the, play, of the, of the production is uh, The Return of Karl May and the undertitle is Entertaining Play for German People. Uh, so, I mean, what, what we got is 40 minutes extracts that had, have some sort of dramaturgy and also uh, video dramaturgy, but it was all filmed in, in one day, actually, in, in, uh, in Rush and edited also in, in Rush. And uh, it was presented there. So that's, you know, all contribution. You, you filmed it in the theater or outside or inside, outside. On stage? In toilets, in on stage, in the uh, I don't know on balcony of the theater. That day there was a, a, a protest. The Balkans, yeah, of the balcony. Yeah, of, well, yeah, <laughs> balcony. There was a protest of the opposition, so we were able to actually film one scene, having this uh, echo of the people screaming, you know, whatever they were screaming. So well, we used the, the 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 venue of the National Theater, and uh, it, of course, now what you get is not what we aim, but it shows you, it gives you some, some ideas, some impulses of what the play will, will, will be. And, uh, yeah. How interesting. Yeah, we had Richard Foreman, the great Richard Foreman, the New York director, avant-garde director, and, it, and because also he can't move as much anymore physically, but now he does two or three days of filming. And then almost for a year sometimes, or a year and a half, he edits it, manipulates it, thinks about it, and says, I'm interested in this moment. So it's a changing world. Karl May, for our views, he's a German, uh, almost romantic writer who most of his 83 novels were about uh, Wild West in America, where a noble white man and his Native American friend, Vinatou, uh, have adventures and 
bring kind of a Christian belief as gentlemen to uh, a country that has violence on each side and uh, this guy who never really went to America. And he wrote also a couple of um, uh, adventurous romantic uh, 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 novels about uh, the Middle East and, and the Far East. Um, by the way, he wrote a play about, a one theater play about an Arab, about the noble Arabs, and uh, which nobody has ever done and yet. But um, so... Um, how was it for you in your country the the experience of uh, corona you know how what, when you heard about it was it just about the what did you do were you in your home with your family I was in, how, how did you experience it what i was in rehearsals actually i was rehearsing and i had to stop because um it was obvious that uh, I, I think I stopped two days before the lockdown started because at the rehearsals, we are talking only about this. So I said, OK, let's uh, have a few days and I will try to write because I'm writing and rehearsing in the same time. And then the lockdown came and I came back to Bucharest. For how long were you in lockdown? How strict was it in Romania? Uh, two months two months and uh, yes, it was quite strict for, how do you say, um, normal population. But then again, I told you there were other movements. So you had the workers living in the middle of a very strict lo lockdown and again, waste coming in transports, in bales uh, in Romania. So it's very, it's very interesting that um, because of the lockdown, you could see this, this movement. For me, it was very interesting. And there was other thing very interesting in Bucharest because I came to Bucharest from Piatra Nams, and for two weeks, uh, the air was unbreathable. And uh, we still don't have a clear answer why, because the, in the first mm. day in the lockdown, the air was very clear and then uh, apparently there were some incinerators burning waste. So I was um, surrounded by this waste story and even could feel it um, myself. So for two weeks, every night it was, it was really, really strange. So that was my personal experience mm -hmm. of this. Alone. So Western capitalists exploiting workers, uh, in, you know, buying up cheap property for, ag for agricultural also, you know, most probably unsafe practices like the slaughter, the inhumane slaughter of these poor animals and the fast speed these workers have to do it and uh, and on top of it they export the waste um from from the west to the east so i can only imagine how um how that feels and we also heard from Mikaela dragan that roma families but the by the police the police came they were harassed they were looked at uh, as exactly. potential spreaders they were beaten up with no reason and some neighborhoods were had preferred treatment, others not. So it also exposed uh, uh, structures of Romanian society. Absolutely, because as I said, everything was already there, social and economical inequalities, and um, I don't know, um, a lot of en environmental issues. And then you have, um, I don't know, um, this uh, precarious health system. Um, so everything was there. It's just that with the pandemic, we could see it um, very, very clear. And how are numbers now in Romania? Uh, well, actually, we, um, we started this period of relaxation, let's say on 15th of May, and um, apparently the numbers are increasing. I mean, um, it's not like um, we should relax. That's what mm. the, number, the numbers say. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think in Romania, but not only uh, in the East, we are quite mimetic. So now we have, uh, like, I don't know, appearing all these uh, conspiracy movements, all these, um, I don't know, uh, guys saying, don't wear masks, uh, blah, blah, blah. And um, I think the society starts to be very divided. And um, yeah, I think we, we are living quite interesting times. Mm -hmm. And I think for the theater, because as you said, at the beginning we thought, okay, this is terrible, it will go. But now we realize that we have to, to deal with that for a longer time and to try to, to I don't know, to, to be creative within these limitations and 
to stay together with our audiences, at least to make a sign, look, we still exist, we are here, and we are trying to get in contact with you. Mm -hmm. To make a little knock knock at the door, how are you? Here we are here. Yeton in Kosovo, tell us a bit, how was the everyday experience? When did the lockdown start? How serious was it? Did well, people was, take it serious? I was in Zurich, uh, in Zurich actually, uh, rehearsing, uh, attend, attending a, a production uh, in, uh, in a small theater called Winkelwiese, a play called Swiss Connection about uh, this Marxist Leninist groups of Kosovo that were operating in uh, Switzerland in the 80s, 90s. So I actually was able to catch the very last plane from uh, Switzerland. Really? Kosovo, yes, I was very lucky. But two actors from Kosovo, they, you know, because in, in Switzerland, it, it was still very normal in mid of uh, February. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't see any, any difference. Anyway, in Kosovo, it was different. It, st it start started earlier. So I came back, but the actors then remained there. And uh, one of them came after maybe uh, two, three weeks. And he had to stay in, uh, in, in quarantine for like two weeks. Uh, it was total lockdown. I mean, you could not uh, go out at all. I mean, we had a limited period, I think, in the first 90 minutes only. And this 90 minutes was uh, according to, the, to some numbers of the ID cards. So your last number of ID cards was, let's say, 9. You could go out from 10 a.m. to uh, 11.30 and so on. So after some time, I think in... April, it changed, it became, um, yeah, maybe three hours in total. So you could go out again, according to some, some numbers. And uh, social distancing or not, or just say go out by three hours, you can go, but 21 every, hours you can't go. Yeah. Everything and also cities, separate cities were in, in quarantine. So you could not really move, let's say for a, a certain period, I was not able to go out of Pristina. But this was one, let's say, uh, drama that was that we were coping somehow, seeing the others around and learning. It was for me traumatic in the beginning. Uh, uh, you know, hoping that it will pass us. I think everybody. Traumatic was. in what sense? Traumatic that uh, I, I was not able to write. You know, I was not able to to do anything creatively. I was, you know drinking, eating and, you know, sleeping. And then when they started to say that it will take until maybe May, I was saying to myself, well, that's not bad, actually. I have some time. And in my mind, I was writing yeah, nearly two plays. But in reality, reality proved that it was not, not like, like, like that. But what I wanted to say is that uh, uh, in the mid, middle of, of this uh, pandemic, then the, the government collapsed. It, I mean, the, they received no no vote no mm -hmm. confidence vote no vote. confidence vote yeah exactly mm -hmm. uh and this was also a big big social trauma so to say because uh, the the new government that just came in power you know for like 50 days had to actually uh leave because of some international euro atlantic you know tensions between Europe and USA and uh, the former prime minister who was, you know, kicked out of his office. He was not able, he was not willing to, uh, to go in the line of, of, uh, of Trump's policy, who insisted in, uh, in a fast peace deal between Kosovo and Serbia, because obviously he wants some sort of uh, diplomatic success. Mm -hmm. you know, for the U.S. elections, no. So the the, the ex uh, prime minister was not willing to to do something fast and without really content. So then they kind of kicked him out, and uh, the new government came. Uh, in that beginning, they promised some five million years for the artistic scene, and we were all very you know enthusiastic that this money might you know come in. It is coming actually in the right moment, but it it never came actually. Never arrived. So, never arrived. And so, uh, you know, what, what, what happened is that uh, in that beginning, theaters gathered together to show the online production, recorded shows of the, of the past. And 
that was very interesting to see that people wanted to see them. At least yeah. the first month, you know, the <coughs> I don't know national theater, the, the first show of national theater got around hundred thousand views. Really? Yeah, yeah. It was really some of your shows. Well, the one of national theater comedy. I mean, all mm -hmm. shows got around fifteen thousand views and so on. So it was an uh, interesting period where people, I think, wanted maybe not to see shows because for me it was not it is still not interesting to see online on, online theater but i think they connected that that to the idea of freedom so they the the online shows reminded them of 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 the past time when they could go freely to the theater and watch shows so it was interesting period that in in may started to fade out and you know the the interest was m much lower but nevertheless Theaters somehow uh, gathered together to to create something and to react to the to the situation. And we have to have in mind that this is very small theater scene. I mean, in in total, you don't have more than twenty five uh, theater productions being produced uh, in a in a season. So, in the country, in the country, yes, in the whole council. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. How is how is artist support in Romania? Did you get any? Uh support from the government is there any promises even made uh, do you as an artist janina did you get anything from your government um uh, there are two cases uh, in romania uh, it's the um, case of state institutions which are subsidized by the state and um, yes the state continued to subsidize the theaters because so everybody is on salary and um well, i'm just saying that this is the case of people employed by in the state, state theater, theater. Mm -hmm. yes uh but this is of course not the case of uh, independent companies and uh, freelance artists and for them yes they um they got some um how do you say um some support some financial mm -hmm. support uh, not big but still something um, for this period of uh, of time but um, then um, just to, to 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 have a reaction to to this uh, again pandemic showed that um, access to art uh, to culture in in general uh, shouldn't be a luxury and a lot of uh, i mean subsidies state the state should uh, should um, support uh, art artists and uh, and art we we see what is going on now in uk for instance where theater uh, are um, facing this danger to to close down in romania and other countries in europe um, in the state institutions we are still safe we don't know for how long but still uh, we have this support so yes, it's it's different if you are a freelance or if you are yeah, if you are a state uh, institution. Mm -hmm. In our case, people were paid the salaries like normal, but of course we. Um, I was always trying to explain that we are working during this time. I mean, we were um, um, proposing to the audience workshops online interactive concerts um, the actors worked for um, for this and we as a team we spend a lot of time together even if it was on zoom to reimagine a way to communicate with our audiences so basically mm -hmm. we had a lot of work to yeah. do during the lockdown yeah our friends at tia varsova georgina said they actually worked much more if they look at ours they were involved in planning for their theaters uh, meetings with politicians everybody people staff keeping um, it's exhausting and a, a huge burden placement but yes i think you're right access to art access to healthcare, access to education is basic human right should be covered and should be covered by by you know taxes and uh, for the for the greater good how uh, how is it for you yet on uh, do you think uh, the theater scene in kosovo will be hit hard will it be or do you think it is something i think we can survive because we never had as much as to rely on the support from the state no, it's true i mean that's as i explained it's very small theater scene mm -hmm. and so 
also politically and socially looking at, at the at the landscape we always had you know crisis some of this was one addition maybe different crisis but you know as i say often we come from crisis we go to a new crisis mm -hmm. so it, it, it's hard to you know to make any any big difference that uh, when it comes to the theater scene uh, majority of the of the theater artists are employed in the in the public institutions let's say national theater or other uh, city theaters and uh, what we have so far is only two independent theaters so one is chandra multimedia that i i, I run and the other one is uh, other theater both in pristina in fact chandra multimedia closed its uh, its venue because the owner decided to sell the the venue so now we are trying to join forces with other theaters so we can at least keep one of those uh, so you lost your space we lost our space not not directly because of the corona but somehow in, in the connected the yeah. owner wanted you know cash and you know he mm -hmm. sold the, the venue. and it is now in the corona time it happened it or is we... now in june so from first of fifth of june actually we we lost of uh, lost our venue that we... it's a very big loss yeah it is. It is. In in fact, it's more loss for 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 Pristina because uh, a cultural venue has has been lost. And while we got used to co-produce and work in in mobility, so to say, so we always used to uh, co-produce or work with other city theaters or with national theater. But that venue in that particular place of Pristina uh, has been lost, and it's uh, it, you know we had that for nearly ten years organizing this. Uh, well-known international literature festival polyp that became you know popular in the southeastern europe and producing rehearsing we, we couldn't show or work there because the venue was small really a, a basement but at least we could rehearse until 10 days before the, the the premiere so that is gone now now we are trying to to see how we can uh, keep this other venue that the the other uh, theater was is having this other theater and uh, the municipality is promising that they will take the you know the rent so they we don't have to pay the rent because the rent is quite high we'll see i mean we are now in this position of trying to uh, mm -hmm. trying to, to survive so to go back to the question it's hard to see the damage that has been made or is being made from the from the corona because you know uh, theater scene was uh, not that strong here and it didn't have any any big impact so to say everything was concentrated in pristina uh while national theater uh, artists keep take uh, getting their salaries you know that that is one of the uh, opportunities you have when you work in public institutions while the independent artists anyway they used to survive you know in different ways through television commercial uh, videos or whatever, or, or lots of them working as, as waiters in, in, in cafeterias. And in, in that sense, yes, that be, can be considered as a, as a loss because, of course, cafeterias were closed, so indirectly, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we do hear alarming signs uh, from Eastern Europe where we always looked up as great superpowers of theater, I think Poland, Hungary, um, the Kosovo and uh, Bulgaria, Romania, there were strong, strong traditions, but now uh, uh, openly the prime minister of Hungary, you know, is uh, censoring or pre promoting economic censorship, defunding theaters, replacing artistic directors with people from the party or people who have the idea of the Heimat of traditional Hungarian, Hungarian uh, uh, plays in Poland. Uh, uh, of course, Warsaw is different than the cities, but on the countryside also, it's a traumatic uh, 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 defunding and open hostilities. They're even declared gay and lesbian free zones. Uh, people are beaten up again and uh, money has been reduced. And, and of course, uh, in some, uh, some, some uh, areas in, uh, in, in Poland or in uh, Hungary, especially Hungary, um, you know, people are afraid. They do not know what their life uh, will bring if they can continue their work in theater. They have made such a great uh, contribution. We also hear in Albania, the National Theater um, was destroyed, if I understand right, also because of real estate interest. Yeton, uh, David Gotthard also 
the great guy who ran the Riverside Studios in London when the Riverside Studios were the Riverside Studios, you know, and forwarded it. It's also a, a devastating sign. Do you, what do you know about the destruction of that theater? Well, I mean, they, the theater was uh, raised, was destructed in the middle of, middle of pandemic on 17th of May, if I remember well. So that was somehow the end of a three year struggle of a group of artists who uh, uh, were uh, guarding the theater day and night, basically sleeping there uh, since three years when the government announced the, uh, the idea of building a new theater. So basically the situation was that, you know, national theater was, it is, it was in fact in the, in the city center there in a very nice place built by, by uh, fascists during the, the, the occupation of Albania, uh, Italian fascism. And uh, it was an old theater in a bad shape, definitely. Yeah. But it looked like an old garage building, almost like an airplane yeah. hangar. Yeah, exactly. but, still. but still, it was, you know, a kind of collective memory. It was more than just the theater. It was the history not only the theater history of Albania in all those 80 years. So it was a symbol of, of Tirana, you know. And so people were trying to protect. Inside it was also in a bad shape, but it remained in a bad shape because the government, and not only just this, just this uh, actual government, but all the other governments, they desperately wanted to, to prove that it's, uh, it's not worthy uh, investing in this theater. So. They invested in the idea of destruction for like nearly 30 years. Mm -hmm. they wanted Meanwhile, uh, Peter Brook said, I want to have an old Decrepit Theatre Le Bouffe, you know, I don't want a new one. You know, yes. that's, it represents the world and we are trying to do something. And, uh, uh, and we are not an institution. We do not represent the state power. You know, we are artists and that's our space. So it's, it's, it's stunning that um, you lost your theatre, you know. It was shocking actually for everybody. I mean, the idea behind, of course, is to serve uh, oligarchs because National Theatre is having a, a huge land around. So basically, they want to, to build a new theatre somewhere there and then use the land uh, behind to build uh, tall buildings at no, shopping malls. Yeah, exactly all that. So it, it is it is uh, it, it was shocking. Uh, especially from the fact that the, the actual prime minister is former artist himself. So that was really a bit, uh, you know, in, in, I mean, the, the fact that he, for like nearly 10 years that he is in power, in fact, of, in, instead of using his uh, creativity and his artistic ability to help and support artists, in fact, he was mostly supporting and helping rebuilding his his image so he, he was having uh, uh, exhibitions in, in different galleries and promoting himself well in his own country he, he kind of uh, showed symptoms of an of an autocrat you know by by destroying this theater but also uh, by i mean controlling the way he's controlling medias and it's it's really scary and i think those are all symptoms that we see not only, uh, as you said, in, in, in Hungary, but also in, in other countries in like Albania, but as well in, 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 in Serbia. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it is a really um, uh, shocking and, uh, and one does not um, understand uh, that, uh, especially Europe and Eastern Europe that had such a great tradition that it would not respect and uh, his, its own history. It's always much more than the, than the, place, um, the place itself. Um, mm -hmm. Just to continue this, because it, I mean, the story of this national theater is, it becomes more tragic from the fact that Albania is the only country in Europe, as far as I know, that has no independent cultural scene. So no independent theaters are existing in, in Albania. So everything is functioning through the public, public theaters. And so when, when you only have public theaters, of course, then you can easily control because you are the one to support them. And then when you have the money, then you can easily support. And this is the case in Albania. That's why the, the civil society and the, the artistic community who, who opposed the idea of destruction of the theater was overless, so to say. They, mm -hmm. you know, they 
they, they were guarding the theater, sleeping there, but still they were not able to really yeah. uh, to keep it. I mean, maybe it was not even possible because the, I mean, the, the, the actual prime minister got very strong recently, but at least uh, in, in all conditions, let's say if I compare this situation to Kosovo, I, I hardly can imagine that a scenario like that could happen here. Could happen. And, and how wonderful that a community comes out, fights for a theater, feels connected, occupies a space. Everybody wants to have built audience and community. There it was. And in a way, like uh, this shocking, uh, in a way, destruction of the Volksbühne under Kassador were through some political um, uh, misunderstandings, most probably. And uh, and, and so many hundreds of thousands of people signed. So why dismantle uh, a community a theater that works and, uh, and replace it uh, with something that's uncertain and the in-between time? Now it is, of course, changing and with you and the festival, but uh, it was um, uh, also stunning that it happened in, in Germany that, but it was a political thing and not a destruction um, of a place, which also is a kind of a visible representation of a value of an historic uh, place and no one would uh, take down uh, uh, the uh, old house where if Abraham Lincoln grew up because it's old, yeah? So it's, uh, it's um, of course, a, a signifier for, for something that is really wrong and the disrespect and disregard for arts represents something is wrong in every society where theater strives, artists strive is a great way, you know, to show that it's a functioning society and the way that what happens here, what we hear just shows something is terribly wrong. I think that's, I mean, destruction of, of a physical building, yes, it is a loss. I mean, in this case, it was a big, uh, big loss. But I think the biggest uh, destruction is the, the kind of attacking the idea of the theater. I mean, this total degradation that in case of Albania was happening for, for nearly 30 years now after the collapse of communism there. And this is, for me, the, the fact that this small group, even a small group of theater artists there decided to protect the theater, gives hope, you know, gives mm -hmm. hope. This, you know, it inspires people and it shows that, you know, the idea should remain, the idea of theater should remain, remain alive. Because for me, a, a theater space like that one was, was a, a symbol of a freedom. I mean, they even had a, an open microphone in front of the theater outside in the garden where nearly every night somebody was, you know, communicating something to the, to the audience, no matter if there were only five or 10 people listening, but, you know, artists, civil society, journalists would go to this open microphone every, every evening. So it became some sort of agora to discuss not only the issues around the theater, but uh, mm -hmm. issues around, you know, the future and actual uh, Albania. Yeah, I mean, we learned now that we are non-essential, theaters are closed, and in a way they always are, like, uh, you know, perhaps in a way fashion, with something if you need, and something that's, you know, a luxury, but something in between, and, but it makes life what is life, we feel alive, we understand um, the good and the bad, the beauty and the horror, and we can see it, and so... Uh, it is said, uh, it is truly um, 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 hard to hear these stories. So Bubos are great workers and to work in the places where you are. What, wh why do you guys do theater in these complex uh, circumstances where, where you are um, uh, involved in? What does theater mean for you and the cities and communities you live in? Janina, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I just wanted to add something to what yep. he said. That um, I also uh, was invited in um, in this theater um, four years ago for a stage reading, and it is true that um, this uh, while while I stay there for a few days, the whole I don't know audience community of artists, everybody was I don't know in this kind of um, very nice dynamic. So um, it really is a big big loss. And uh, I think also the international community of artists tried to support. I, I remember that this struggle last, did last some time. And I also uh, sent a statement to when, when, uh, when they were occupying the space there. But um, um, this situation shows something that, um, I don't know, it's happening a bit all over the world. The profit 
and uh, other other priorities um unfortunately they um they managed to to i don't know crash down things that are uh, important for the community and also they represent something um i don't know um for for many many generations i would say mm -hmm. so uh, yeah um about um what why we are doing theater um i think i think we all i think every theater artist is doing this um this um is doing theater because of this live experience and i think that is in danger now and it's impossible to to do but then as yeton said before i realized that actually yes in the east in most of the countries we had crisis after crisis after crisis and somehow we always survived and somehow we always we are very adaptable i would say and uh, i think this this uh, in a way uh, it's good because after the initial shock you start to say okay and now with these restrictions what can we do and um, i know i know that uh, in romania the economical situation will have a big impact on the state institutions as well so um, the thing is that when you have a lot of money it's easy to be creative when you don't you have to to find to find ways but i think uh, yeah i think it will be very very challenging to be a theater to be in performing arts everywhere in the world but um, yeah i i think we are we are trying not to lose hope and to try all the i don't know all the possibilities to stay in contact with uh, with the community the theater that i'm running in theatre um is um is a theater in a town of um probably 100,000 people so it's a small city and uh, i uh, i am manager there since 3 years already and uh, what interested me was to 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 bring um to bring a new audience uh, it's not a university city so basically a lot of uh, people from high school a lot of teenagers come to to um, to the theater and we have a lot of programs uh where we involved um, we involved uh, these young people we even uh, invite them to be assistant assistant director assistant playwright during to see how a performance it's done they are very much involved they were very much involved in uh, live um, rehearsals and uh, we also uh, were doing a lot of um, workshops in rural areas with children so not only in the city but also in so we were trying to bring different audiences to to the theater before the pandemic and this of course now we had to stop this kind of um, of audience development but we are trying to to move a part in online even if i'm not a big fan of uh, seeing shows online i'm not but uh, workshops or other things we can uh, we can try to do and then uh, little by little to to find ways to um, if they cannot come to theater we have to find a way so we go to to meet them somehow in the open air um i don't know in site specific uh, projects we we will um, we we are responsible to to find uh, a way but again it's very interesting because it is a small community it's um probably for for theaters in bigger cities would be a bit more difficult i think because a small community unites around the theater and um, they um, in this town they come a lot to see to see the shows so we mm -hmm. perform uh, i don't know uh, sometimes even six shows per per week so they are used to be very close to to this theater mm. i don't know if i answered the question no 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 yeah yeah fine why I'm doing theater in general, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit difficult to, to resume in, uh, to say in few words. So. But still, if you say, why do you believe in, in, in theater? And because you perhaps 
closer to it, but also Romania had the revolution. Of course, there was the civil war, there was Sarajevo, the Kosovo uprising. It's complex, complex uh, uh, things that happen where Corona might not look as the most threatening thing. But um, so what, why, why do you believe in, in, in creating theater? Well, I think um, what is very special about theater, it's this um, meeting with the audience, but not only during the performance. Um, since 10 years, um, after, um, after the opening nights, but not only, we are doing a lot of um, discussion artist talks. And um, I think this, um, this meeting in a very safe place allows people with very different um, opinions to express themselves. And this you cannot see uh, in uh, television or in other um, forms of expression, let's say, in other arts. And um, I never experienced um, in the artist talk, artist talks that I, I've um, I've seen or done um, aggr aggression, uh, violence, the violence that you see in online in social media because the moment uh, you are face to face to somebody the moment you meet you really meet the person a dialogue can start even if you do not agree even if you have very different opinions the theater has this um, ability and has this to offer this frame where a dialogue can can exist and um, and i think that's um, that's one of the reasons i believe a, a theater can, can uh, how do you say, um, create a community. Like really, in a very concrete way, not like, um, I don't know, not in an abstract, not speaking in abstract terms, but really like, um, and, and I've, seen, I've seen discussions like this with people having very different opinions about theater, about politics, but still being able to communicate. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's important. And looking at this very uh, polarized world, I think we will miss this kind of direct dialogue. Mm -hmm. I but we can reinvent it somehow. Sorry, I don't. Oh, no, no problem. No, I mean, that's more or less what I also wanted to say. and. Uh... I would like to connect this uh, question to a little, now I tell it as an anecdote, but it happened in reality a couple of uh, years ago, 2017, I think. Uh, we were just uh, a day before the premiere of a, of a play called Bordel Balkan, when a group of war veterans entered the National Theater and they uh, wanted us to stop the play because it hurts the national feelings and uh, it's uh, anti-liberation war and so on and so forth. So all those uh, uh, war cliches, so to say. And I remember how, you know, it was maybe naive, but I was really fighting. I mean, in sense that I was saying, no, you cannot stop it. It won't be possible. And those were not just ordinary citizens but you know war veterans so powerful people and i, I, I you know one of them was saying look uh, we just stopped a, a session of the of the of the parliament a couple of days ago so stopping a theater play it will be just an easy thing and my answer was no you can uh, you can easily stop a as assembly session but you won't be able to stop a theater play and they they were like looking at me surprisingly like is, is he normal what is you know and so in, in it, i mean i was threatened to death and so on and so forth but to, to make this uh, story uh, short i was after thinking what made me you know stay like that and what made me believe that they won't be able to stop a theater play i think it's the idea of of a freedom i think you know we we the, uh, for me, theater makes sense because of this bond that it has with the freedom. So we want to to have freedom on stage, and we uh, aspire this uh, the, uh, freedom on stage because we want to have freedom in society. So free stage is some sort of 
testimony of a free uh, society. So I was not fighting for a theater play that day, but it was fighting for my own freedom. And uh, it, it is interesting because next day, you know, the audience came. Of course, there was lots of police inside and the, or, uh, around the theater, but people came as an act of, of support. I mean, it was a resisting act, so to say. So for them, to me, it was not just coming to see a theater play. So it was some sort of ritual of, uh, of uh, fighting for freedom because I believe they knew that if somebody will stop a theater play today, next day they will they will come to stop something else they will take another part of our freedom so i mean this is for me fascinating and this is what i i always wanted to uh somehow be able to do meaning that you know a free stage where i i'm able to work freely because for me a free free work on stage means uh, a, a free society and that i think that's that's for me the what I could answer to the to to the mm -hmm. question. So we believe in in theater because we believe in our on, in our freedom. We want theater to be free because we want our society to be to be free. Uh, I mean, a blackmail theater, a captured theater, is is a sign that the society is captured, is blackmail blackmailed by the by the politicians, by the powers, and so on. Mm -hmm. Do you both feel? And this is a very significant, but what you both said, what that Peter means. Do you, do you feel that Corona time is changing how you think about theater? Personally, no, because I, I'm still fighting to uh, to see all this period as a as a as a dream, so to say. I'm not trying to wake up and to realize that. It is happening and it is continuing. So I'm still hoping that it will be finished soon, so we go back to the to the normality, so to say, to the to the to the times where we can do theater on stage. So I still don't want to uh, to believe, and I don't want to accept the fact that we might have to to adapt. That's my my maybe I'm still dreaming, but you know I'm still continuing the. You know where I, where my thoughts are left, and trying to connect, to connect them to the to the future. So, that I believe I, I see this. I, I will see this as a as a gap in between. Just as when you wake up from a, from a dream, that you know. Well, um, I I don't think if in a very, how do you say, radical way, it will change my idea about theater and I don't know the reasons for which I decided to do theater. But um, I think our work as artists will be, and I've said that before, even in the first month of lockdown, our work will be shaped by this, um, by this um, situation. And it's inevitable in a way. And um, then, as an artist, uh, I'm I'm not very I don't know um, interested to to explore let's say this kind of uh, theater done by Zoom whatever I'm not I'm not very interested in that, but um, I'm also manager of an institution and uh, somebody who has to invite artists and to think about the, the audience uh, of this uh, theater. And then, as I said, we really have to survive and to survive not alone, but together with this community, with this audience. And in this sense, um, we have to, to explore and to, to find ways to, to be together, even in this situation of social distancing and uh, I don't know, sometimes impossibility to to meet the audience. So I don't know, I, I think we are still in, in the process and um, mm -hmm. I don't think we have all answers. I, I think we are still trying to, to find our, way, our ways and to figure out what, how we will matter, if we will matter as artists um, in this. Um, I hope we will. 
and I hope we will find a way to 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 be together with with our audience. Yeah. Will your countries change for the better, or do you think it's a moment where autocrats will grab and take more liberties away instead of opening? I mean, in, in, in my opinion, this pandemic created some sort of mirroring where you can clearly see, you know, in, in terms of politics, you could clearly see who is really trying to, you know, to help or to do something worth it for the society and who is really cheating and who are those who, who want to benefit. So uh, at least in that sense, I believe that people will, will, uh, will kind of understand and in the hoping that in the new elections they will, you know, they will make better, better choices. So, but you know, it's hard to to predict how how the society will be shaped from from this uh, from this pandemic. Now, in the beginning, when you started to mention countries that are allowed to enter European Union, I, I, I believe Kosovo was not in the in the list. Yeah. So, as you know, or maybe you don't know, but Kosovars are still the only Europeans that cannot travel without visa into, into, into Europe. So this is, uh, you know, permanent struggle that we, when it comes to pandemic, this seem, seems as a, as a, you know, it's not a mi minor struggle, but it, it seems comparing to the other, other struggles that we were, we were, you know, going through all those, uh, those years since, uh, since nineties. But uh, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. But the, the, the fact is that in middles of local politics, you see also lots of uh, clashes uh, between, you know, European, European, different, different European states and USA. I mean, the, the struggle for, for control, for power, for uh, showing who is in charge. Now, you know, there is this uh, Kosovo case and the Kosovo dialogue political di dialogue with, with Serbia that they say it should end with a, a peace agreement. But this has been going for like nearly 15 years now and uh, the results are still nowhere. And in, in kind of compare, comparing to, to other uh, issues around pandemic, this, the, you know, it, it seems as a ma major, major issue. Yeah, there's still no no um, uh, major agreement, right? There has not been. Oh, no. Um, and th this has been uh, absorbing the energy of, of this country and not on, of, of this country only, but of Serbia as well, because the, the main focus since 20 years now was in this, you know, internal fights in around the border, in around the resources, in around the you know, war in around the uh, war crimes and so on and so on. So it, we are kind of uh, tight in, a, in, in this, uh, in this uh, story that the pandemic is, of course, not, not, it, it's not a good thing, but it's just another level of... It's another, another level in the whole maelstrom of things. Uh, it's an additional thing. I can only imagine what it means. What, Janina, do you think uh, Romania will change for the better? Things that are exposed, will they be, will the new forms be found that work better? Well, I think um, that you have now, like you started today with um, this, um, how do you say, this image, like uh, it sounds, I don't know, like an, in a science fiction movie. And uh, I think in every country, um, you you can see um, this model replicated in different degrees, of course. And I think, as I already said, there are so many uh, interconnections um, in the whole world, because now um, I'm I'm thinking that a, to this global crisis, a global global answer is needed. Um, because we have so many problems with the, I don't know, global warming. They were all waiting there and we were like not looking, but now we are face 
and it's all of us. Um, and uh, I think the the global answer will uh, I don't know um, will be the good one or the bad one. I, I now we have on the table all the possibilities. I, I think uh, Romania could go worse, like also Hungary and Poland and so on. I don't think you can be alone good in this, I mean, to, to do better in this, uh, in this world. So um, I think the um, international politics will have a huge impact, especially on countries like Romania, who are parts of different uh, agreements and so on. So um, I'm hoping for the best for um, USA, for uh, EU, for everybody, because um, yes, we will, it, it will impact everybody. Kosovo as well, Every, it, will, it will have, um, I cannot think of, um, I don't know, of Romania only as mm -hmm. a, but of course, um, um, there are so many, so many things like I've already spoke about, about uh, our export of cheap labor on the um, Western market, let's say. And I think here the Romanian government has, um, how do you say, they, they do have a responsibility that they didn't take it up till now. And this is the moment to do it. We are waiting. So this could be a good change. This could, could change, but not only for <laughs> Romania, but other countries in the East. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. situation of, um, I don't know, all of us, we are in precarious situations all over the world, not only workers in cheap labor, but artists like we see now with freelance artists and so on. So in this sense, um, things, if uh, things would change for the better would be to give some, I don't know, um, to give these people um, a perspective for their future. Because now everybody's thinking from one day to another day. And it's not only in Romania, and it's not only starting with this pandemic. For years, for at least 10, 15 years, we started to lose the rights that our parents had in all Europe. So we start to lose it little by little without even noticing from one day to another. So I think uh, if it would change to the better, in this sense, it has to change. Yeah, to be able to, to imagine a future. To, to have imagine, to be able to imagine it. And that also the realizing that the ability to imagine is maybe the, the dream itself. Who knows what will happen, but we all need to be able to imagine that, to be part of it, and that we have a future. So we act responsibly. And I think perhaps, yeah, maybe it should be the United States of Europe uh, in realizing that uh, there are no longer national individual situations. This is a global Thing. And as so many people do say, what is facing us in environmental threats, this uh, coronavirus might be kindergarten experience, you know, of what might really happen um, when it comes to water resources, uh, when it comes to temperatures rising, when it comes to malaria flies surviving in Europe all of a sudden because the temperature changes. So it's uh, so many things we, we do not know about. It's a time of great uncertainties. We are in our rooms. Uh, we look outside and we are wondering and uh, at least the western world western europe and america north america they have not been in that state of uncertainty it's something new our colleagues from uh, palestine or from uh, libya or as you say in kosovo and in a way also romania there has been uh, upheavals but it has perhaps not never been as strong for for the western world and um, our colleagues in africa say you know 400,000 people die of malaria each year um, so the same amount of people who died of COVID, but nobody cares. We don't even have money for vaccinations for measles. So um, now the Western world is infected and everything stops. How can that be? This is such an injustice. And um, and uh, and um, we will also have to find our own ways to come to a bit to a close and really thank you both for coming here and joining us. And I think each one of you could have had their own session, but I think also you really complemented each other so very, very well. What do you say to young artists, uh, maybe to yourself when you, when you started out, what do you say to artists? How should they use this time of Corona? Or what should they look forward to or imagine? And maybe also to our audiences, what, how, how should we deal with this time of, um, of Corona? Okay, Janina, yeah, maybe. Jan 
but yeah. Well, I mean, I have no. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. Yep. So, Jayton, go ahead. Go on. No, I mean, it, I I'm looking at myself that I was not able to to be that creative as I I, I wished. So I was hoping to write, and I started, and I stopped, and I started, and I stopped. I would say that you know they should realize that uh, you know that this this situation might continue and then they they should catch the rhythm i don't know if i was able to catch the rhythm myself but at least i was able to convince myself that yeah this could be the normality i mean what was the normality before might come maybe later from September, October, but let's now accommodate ourselves into this new reality and uh, believe that this is, you know, what we have and try to, to do the, the, the work you are, you are supposed to do as, a, as an artist. So if in case of, of play rights, I would, you know, ask them to, to write. And I think for some of them, I know who was saying that this is like a honeymoon for, 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 for some people because for a writer, is a miracle to be able to to stay home and uh, you know be around without any other uh, obligations. I don't know if it, if it's if it's completely true that be, because for me the idea that I was not able to go outside then was complicated because normally I was you know for a long time longing for this period of being home and uh, without having to go to my office. Yeah, some 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 people might might want to use this situation. I mean, some writers, I would say, for directors, for let's say Blair, I was having and is still having difficult period because she's used to do things on stage. I mean, she's not able to adapt really to this uh, new rhythm, and I, I suppose this is similar for many many uh, other theater theater makers. Okay, um, well, I think, I mean, I don't like to give advices to, to younger artists as I didn't like advices when I was younger, but um, there, is, um, there is something that I could notice myself. I didn't feel very creative as well um, when we stopped the rehearsals. I was hoping to write and um, I didn't manage. Even today, I didn't. I did the visual essay, but the play is not written. But uh, I'm very happy about that because uh, at some point I stopped um, putting pressure on myself and because the reality was much more interesting for me. And um, I think years and years uh, I was used to work under pressure, even if I work one performer performance or maybe two every year because I do a lot of research before and a lot of improvisation so I spend a lot of time even in discussions with the actors so my process is longer than the classic one with readings and then staging so I was never um, I don't know um, I never worked a lot in this sense of many shows but now I really feel that we need to, um, to accumulate experience and we need to look to this reality because it's so interesting. And I'm not saying only about the big things that you, we can see. I, I also speak about, um, I don't know, more subtle things. And I think as an artist, you really need to, to observe these things and to take your time. And then um, in the last years, the, um, the rules of the market, of the art market, were putting a lot of pressure on many, many artists. And it's time to just reflect and not be so productive no matter what. I think that would be my advice, to exit this logic of productivity and competitivity and so on. I think just, I don't know, look around. It's important. We were spending so much time in inside the theaters and just doing and producing and more content and sometimes just for the sake of content. Now, just look around. Yeah, that's uh, 
that's significant advice to stop, look around, uh, slow down, to adapt to the situation, as Yeton said, and to, uh, you know, really be, be in the moment. And I think if we want to change uh, also our realities, we also will have to change authentically. And, um, and we, we will see um, where this all goes. We are too close to the time we live in now. We really are, we are blind, we can't see it. But I think artists that always, um, you know, have insights that we, uh, that we uh, should rely on. And I think the idea to really say this is no, now global solutions are needed and it's no longer about national strongmans. And uh, so really, and what is so much that's wrong also in the US, it's also just a very big, big island. And it's realizing that at the moment and it's no longer on the forefront of of, um, uh, of uh, finding forms and ideas to inspire visions, to inspire imagination, and that all one feels the things have come down and there are less and less liberties and there they were before. And we, of course, here have the, the killings uh, that uh, George Floyd and others, the social unrest on the city. And we don't know what this summer will bring. And uh, we think signs are not good, but uh, hopefully I think elections will also uh, reevaluate uh, uh, priorities and uh, and thank you again also for you guys to know uh, Romania uh, uh, kind of uh, featured in in, in uh, significantly in uh, in New York theater um, I think there was a production of the Met Forest uh, by Carol Churchill which um, was co-directed by uh, Ashley uh, Kelly and uh, it was also interrupted and then with a the coder they were able to uh, get the uh, Zoom uh, software um, design uh, permission to manipulate it. So they created a performance that was uh, reviewed by the New York Times. And it's one of the first things also I saw, because I share with you, it's hard to just see recordings and nothing, but it's really a, a work of art she created. Maybe this is something for um, actually to connect with you, or maybe create a version for, for, um, for also for Romania, where she really, uh, in a stunning way, combined aesthetics of early computer games, graphic novels, um, state propaganda TV, and then scenes um, um, out of out, out of that truly extraordinary uh, play. And um, again, thank you both, you know, for for all your work and uh, and you're such great artists, significant artists in in, in your own way. Also, remember Janina, your readings uh, of the plays in New York and. Uh, the work you did, uh, Yiton, you know, who went around small towns, also in Kosovo, was a play that had as gay lesbian themes, unheard of, uh, with words. Really, you put your life and your bodies at risk. Uh, you promote change, and you also um, and take that very, very serious. And conditions are so very different for, for both of you than for us here in the U.S. or in Western Europe. So it's good to hear from you, and uh, we think about you. Your work is significant and important, and please do keep on doing and find forms and find ways and let's all stay in uh, contact. And one day I'm sure we will see each other again live. So it's really thank you for the update from Kosovo, uh, from Romania, and that we touched on that theater in Albania, which is a scandal. And it is so wrong to do this without a real plan and without really respectfully negotiating. And, um, but it is a sign of the time and maybe also these days come to an end and something new emerges it will be good. Uh, the great Antonio Gramsci, the Italian philosopher said, when uh, the old days are gone and the new ones haven't arrived yet, monsters appear. And in this chiaroscuro, this kind of in-between darkness, I think it's a time we live through now, Spider Women, a Native American company when women said, you know, we are experiencing a creational myth. Uh, the, we have a mad king. We are uh, there's the, the plague in the country, things don't work, everything's not, but we have enough to find our way to, to resurrect it. It's all about us. It's also about the listeners who are listening to us, what you can do and the same work you guys do with your communities and your own very own communities and your own artistic work. So thank you for listening. It is important that our friends uh, from Eastern Europe do know that we do care about them, but we do not just import our garbage and uh, look there for cheap labor. These are significant places with a great history, with great, great artistic contributions that countries have made to the arts and to the world in itself. And um, so it's important to have good work, good plays, but also good audiences. Thank you for listening. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting us out of Emerson College, uh, Thea, Vijay and uh, Travis, and my Siegel team, Andy and uh, Sanyang, 
Tomorrow we have also a significant guest uh, from France, is Frédéric Aït Duati, and she will talk about her work with Bruno Latour, a significant thinker, philosopher, uh, very much on the environmental conscious and uh, our uh, uh, ecological thinking and uh, on Brecht and uh, the continuing of thinking. And uh, so they're experimenting things also with the Berlin Festspiele with Thomas Oberander, and we will get uh, some insights of how, how she thinks the days we live in uh, could contribute to new thinking, new forms towards theater and uh, performance. On Thursday, we have um, Iman Aoun from Palestine, uh, from her great Ashtar Theater, and she also producing work in very difficult circumstances already, politically, socially, artistically. And, um, and now there is this uh, Corona crisis, as you also pointed out next to the civil wars and everything you experienced at the revolutions. Um, and though, so this COVID is a, creating an additional uh, complication. And Friday, we hear from Jamaica, English speaking Caribbeans, uh, Sakina Dia and Ivoni Walters will tell us what does it mean to be a theater artist in Jamaica now in general, but also in a time um, of COVID. Uh, so um, thank you all for listening. Uh, do stay safe, uh, wear masks. Uh, Stay tuned in and I hope to see you again. And both of you really, thank you for taking the time and energy and taking the conversation um, so serious. Yetan and uh, thank, thank you, Janina, to, to, to thank you. share thank us. You, so really, um, we think of you and your work is of, of real, real significance and as part of a global effort by the theater community and performing arts community to make the world a better place. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.